Chambers of Commerce across the UK are working with our members and customers to keep trade moving during the COVID-19 crisis. My name is Paul Britton. I'm Chief Executive for Thames Valley Chamber of Commerce. And over the weeks ahead, I'm going to be bringing you insights and opinions from key business leaders across the Thames Valley region, from sectors such as pharmaceuticals and life sciences to automotive and advanced engineering. All of this while we carefully and diligently begin to restart the Thames Valley turbo engine. Our first interview is with the impressive Hugo Fry. Hugo is General Manager UK for Sanofi, and Sanofi are headquartered on Thames Valley Park, and they're at the forefront of drug discovery and vaccines. So Hugo, uh, great to see you again. And last time we met was shortly after uh, uh, you introduced your new impressive Thames Valley Park headquarters, uh, 500 employees there. That was towards the end of last year. Um, so perhaps we can start there. I mean, how has, how has uh, business been impacted by COVID-19 locally? Well, the, the first impact has been, because we're still relatively new in our building in Thames Valley Park in Reading, um, the biggest impact is people haven't been able to go in at all. We, we, we very quickly put everybody on home working. Uh, and, you know, there's a sense of disappointment because we were so excited about uh, the fit out we did in that office, the, the kind of agile working and collaborative working that allowed us to perform every day that, uh, you know, there's a bit of a sense of disappointment we can't make the most of it, but we all know why we're doing it and the very good reasons we are. And because we were so flexibly employed anyway, and we encourage people not to spend time in traffic jams and really be productive and concentrate on outputs. We were very well set up for um, for home working anyway. So that, that was, was yeah. lucky. I can actually tell you an anecdote. Uh, everyone's got very uh, used to using Zoom. We, you and I, Paul, are using it today. Sanofi was the first multinational in the world to use Zoom. Um, Zoom's biggest client had only 10,000 employees uh, when we first uh, uncovered Zoom on the west coast of the US and yeah. uh, we suddenly went straight in 110,000 users. So, you know, we've helped develop this technology with the company and we're very happy about it. Um, you, you mentioned your team. I mean, I've, I've had the pleasure of working with uh, and my colleagues at the chamber working with both your executive team and, and some of the you know, the, the pharmacists and biologists and others that, 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 that you employ. And what struck me is, is, is how passionate your team are around the work that you're doing. So how have you how have you noticed? I mean, there must be a siege mentality at the moment as you're focused on drug discovery. What's, how are you tapering that within the team? Because I, I suspect it needs to be quite methodical. It's not something you can get so excited about that, um, that it's a distraction rather than a, uh, you know, rather than an attribute. Well, yes, you're right. So in terms of business continuity, we had to be very focused. And the first thing uh, we had to be focused on was getting existing medicines and vaccines to the people who needed them, uh, not interrupting the supply chain, because these are yeah. vital medicines. So that, that included our factories. So we have one factory in the UK, in Suffolk, in Haverhill, and those are key workers that went back. They never stopped working that we provided them as much equipment and, and, and safe distancing as possible so they could continue to manufacture the medicines that uh, the world needed. Equally, our supply chain teams have been working day and night and our warehouse teams to make sure there's no break in distribution. Even medicines that come came from Northern Italy at the peak of, of the pandemic have been managed to get through. We've never dipped below 95% capacity. And today we're running a normal in our supply chains. So that was our biggest focus and our laser focus at the beginning, getting medicines and vaccines to the people who need them. And so just to be clear, what I'm taking from that is that you've got the, the, uh, the team also focused upon the COVID scenario in terms of the vaccines and discovery around that. But I read that around two thirds of your medicines are already uh, described as essential. So you're just trying to keep capacity in both of those key streams of work. Yeah, absolutely right. So, you know, rather than a dip in work in our industry, we've actually seen an increase because we've got our daily work plus the work on COVID-19 on top of yeah. that. So, you know, uh, Sanofi has a couple of treatments that are used for other um, uh, ailments that are in clinical trials in the UK, including in the UK, 
for the treatment of COVID-19. This is the thing that makes the symptoms less worse, less bad, and that, that could help you in your recovery. And we're also entered into a, a couple of vaccine discovery um, yeah, projects. Yeah. And of course, Sanofi, our vaccine division, Sanofi Pasta, is one of the biggest in the world. So we're taking a key role in that. Okay, well, I'm, I'm going to ask you, a, it's, it's a challenging question. I hope it's not an unfair one, but uh, how confident, why are you so confident that we're going to find a vaccine for COVID? Well, it's, it is, no, it's a really good question because often vaccines take can take 10 years or more to get through all the discovery phases, the development phases and approval phases until they're finally produced in enough quantity and available to the public to protect them. So it's a really good question. The difference here is never in the history of vaccine discovery and development have there been so many projects ongoing, has there been such amazing collaboration around the world on projects. You know, one example of that is you know, what you think is competitive rivals, Sanofi and GSK, have got together to, to use our technology in vaccine development and their technology in making vaccines more effective in smaller volumes to try and come up with a COVID-19 vaccine. You know, and there's many, many others, um, projects like this going on. You know, if it's ours, great. If it's somebody else's, then great as well. And, you, and you've got a clear line of sight on that. You're, you're vice president for the A, A. Let me get this right for the ABPI, the Association of British Pharmaceutical Industries. So, you've always been a great. When we've spoken, you've been a great advocate for the UK pharmaceutical sector. I mean, build on that. Build on what you're just saying. How has um, the UK responded? Because I'm, I'm hearing of trials in Oxfordshire and other, and other businesses across the Thames Valley, in particular, that have. Uh, many of the chamber members that are, are contributing to this, but I'd really welcome your thoughts on it. So, so the pharmaceutical industry is really mobilised. I mentioned, first of all, you know, the number of key workers we've got to secure production and, and delivery of essential medicines and vaccines. Um, I, I could also mention the way we mobilised, not just in the pharmaceutical industry, but our collaboration with academic centres and scientists and the government and the regulatory authorities to move these trials through the process extremely quickly to get them done. I think that's another really key area. I'd say, you know, we have a lot of expertise in the pharmaceutical industry and the number of uh, um, doctors that have gone back to the front line of COVID, the number of scientists that have gone back to the front line of testing. In our own organization in Sanofi, we've had two guys who are experts in segmenting groups and, and logistics around the country. So they've been supporting NHS England in identifying where the swabs and the tests need to go to the most vulnerable people to make sure they get them first. And that is expertise we have in-house that we've lent to the NHS and they've really been appreciative of that. So pharmaceutical industry is supporting the effort in so many ways from fundamental research and development to production to supply and individual expertise as well. And how and how has government responded, Hugo? I mean, I, we're at this stage now where we're hearing the word restart, and I'm getting lots of questions clearly from local businesses around what that can mean for them. I mean, from from a from a, a pharmaceutical uh, business point of view, from a, a key local employer's point of view, what would you expect to hear over the next few weeks, and, and what would you uh, want to hear? What I want to hear is clear advice that can be easily followed. We're absolutely going to support whatever the government guidance is. My ask is make it clear so we can manage uh, our own. We have our own plans um, to, to be safety. So if people do have to come back into the office, we'll allow them, we'll allow them to do it safely. Um, we are con obviously concerned about people who have to come into the office by public transport. We'll be keeping a very close eye on what the government's recommendation is there and see what the alternatives are. In the meantime, we have very good facilities to continue home working. We're also concerned about our field forces. We have um, scientific liaisons in the field, we have salespeople in the field, we have a number of people working out, going into healthcare organisations and seeing healthcare professionals. Now, obviously, we only want to do that if we're supporting them and adding value. 
at the same time, you know, guidance of people going into healthcare organisations would be very useful as well, because you know that's a good way where we continue to do clinical trials or support patients uh, who are getting treatment, like oncology patients, or making sure each GP surgery has enough flu vaccine for the upcoming flu season. So there's many ways where we're supporting that, and we guidance on going into healthcare organisations would be very useful. So that field testing, I, I, one would imagine that PPE is a is a, a terminology that we perhaps a year ago very few of us heard a, a, a lot about, um, but now it's front and centre in terms of that this this restart. Uh, I mean, have you got any thoughts, or is there an approach from from within Sanofi or the pharmaceutical sector generally around the role of PPE? Yeah, I, I we have quite strong thoughts because you know we don't want there to be guidance that would enter companies against the NHS into some kind of silly bidding war for different yeah, PPE yeah. products. That would be ludicrous. So we'd like the guidance to be equated with the levels of PPE that are available. You know, and if it's not safe, then, then don't do it. Um, if it's reasonable to have a mask, and there's enough masks for those recommendations, then yes, let's use them. But let's not outstrip the, 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 the supply so the frontline, you know, we're competing against frontline works or things like that for silly reasons. So, you know, a bit of common sense and sensible planning versus the supply that's available would be greatly received. That, that, that mirrors uh, the, the call to action that the British Chambers of Commerce has made into the, the PM over the weekend and, and trying to get to grips with this capacity issue around PPE and, you've de and describing exactly as you've done there where uh, we're not um, causing a, 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 an issue around resourcing the frontline and NHS workers against the private sector. Exactly. Um, so it is, a, it is a careful balance and I think that's one of the expectations that we'll be looking for is, is, a, is a growth in capacity and particularly for the pharmaceutical sector and whether they're going to look to restart sector by sector or region by region. But clearly if you're, if you're involved as a, a sector in uh, delivering drugs that are essential to the health and well-being of, um, of the population, then does, uh, does government seem to prioritise one sector or another? It's, it's, it's really challenging and um, um, I, I know that um, the APPI have, have also been um, lobbying directly into government alongside, uh, alongside chambers around that. That's right. Um, okay, so look, uh, t taking a step back from um, uh, from the uh, drug discovery side and, and the restart side, um, really proud that across the region we've had some outstanding examples of uh, local businesses, large and small, actually going that step further to co contribute in some way, either in terms of developing, you know, hand sanitizer, or changing production lines, or, or, or local community. Um, there's a couple of examples that I've picked up in the press, um, which I'll, I'll ask you just to elaborate on. You're doing some work with Red Cross locally in in Reading. Let's start. Let's start with that. So yeah, we do we do uh, a lot of work uh, with uh, local organisations. We we had to go quite quickly because obviously we're new to Thames Valley or mm -hmm. relatively new, um, but we identified a, a, a number of very good causes and causes that know how to use support a lot. So you know we're continually looking. The Red Cross is one, but there there are others where we, we will become, you know, real partners and, and do our bit for the local community. And I think that's really important. And I think there's been a lot of joined up thinking as well through, through you guys at, at the Chamber, but also, you know, amongst uh, other pharmaceutical companies in the Thames Valley to really support what, where it'll make a difference. And what, you know, the commitment I've given to the membership of the wider business community is, is that in time, in good time, when the fog lifts around this, we'll, we will be able to pay tribute to those businesses in some way. And there are many of them, the local authorities, the schools and, and, and the other frontline services. Um, and um, you know, that's part of the role of the Chamber is, is, is both to you know, celebrate and to try and provide that inspiration to all. And, and that's been, that pledge has been well received, but obviously we're, we're eager to ourselves to, to get more guidance around the, the restart so that we can uh, in some way, slowly over time, safely, uh, try to get back to uh, get back as close as we can to normal business. Yeah, that's great. Um, the efforts, I have to say, the, the chain have been excellent. So thank you. 
just some final thoughts and thank you for that um i mean we've we we're not publicly funded so we're dependent upon uh, membership and uh, uh trade customer support and i'm delighted to hear that you've uh, as a business managed to uh sail through the supply chain challenges because many of the businesses that we're working with do continue to have um, those supply chain uh issues and we're lobbying the government very hard around um what more can be done because it's, it's you mentioned transport it is around that integrated uh, tr approach to transport to schools to healthcare, um and um i'd be working close continue to work closely with you and your team hugo on that um any anything that you think that you've in particular, you've taken away any lessons learned over the over recent weeks that um, you'd like to share with uh, Thames Valley Chamber of Commerce members. And welcome, Matt. Yeah, I, I mean, I, I think uh, the first thing is the human aspect of it. Um, you know, we're starting to all know people have been touched by COVID-19, and I think we have to be uh, sensitive to this, and we understand that the, the planning required is quite immense, and I think. Uh, once the dust has settled, it'll be, it'll be very important to look at the levels of planning that are going on um, and, and whether, you know, our level of preparedness is the right level of preparedness. Mm. I think uh, in terms of employee resilience, I think uh, I'm actually amazed by the resilience that people have worked at Sanofi. But, you know, we're not all coping with it in the same way. And if there was a recent Mori poll done for the BBC that says, you know, 50-50, some people are kind of okay with it, but there are 50% who are struggling. And so we do need to keep an eye on that. And, uh, you know, there's nothing wrong. It's absolutely perfectly okay not to feel okay in this kind of situation. And we all need to be sensitive to that as well. And I think supporting our workforce through this is really important. Your team have been always been strong advocates of, of mental health and well-being. There were already some programmes in, in in play that we were working on as a chamber with Sanofi, uh, and I think that's this is only going to accelerate that. And it'll, I think across the wider community, chamber and, and elsewhere, you can see that the, the mental health agenda and the resilience agenda is only going to climb. And I'm sure it's going to be a big feature of our business manifesto next year as well. I couldn't agree more, Paul. Okay, Hugo, stay well. Good wishes to you and your team. Keep up the good work. Thank you very much.